Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is author and journalist Jonathan Rausch, guest scholar at the Brookings Institution, a columnist for the National Journal, and a correspondent for the Atlantic Monthly. Jonathan, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks, Russ. I'm very happy to be here. Our topic for today is a fascinating article that you wrote in a recent issue of the Atlantic on a new venture by General Motors called the Volt. Tell us what the Volt is. The Volt is a plug-in electric car, which aims to be the first mass-market car that you can drive around most of the time without burning any gas at all. How's it going to uh, avoid burning gas, and where does the gas-burning part come in? Well, here's the problem. If you want to build an electric car today, um, you have to do one of two things. You either have to spend, basically charge $100,000 for an enormous battery, um, or you have to accept severe compromises in the range, like a car that only drives a few miles and then needs to recharge. GM decided to aim for a sweet spot. What they do is the car will drive 40 miles on a charge. Um, you plug it in at night. It charges up in an ordinary electrical socket in six to eight hours. You drive it up to 40 miles, and then after 40 miles, it's got an onboard internal combustion powered generator, which recharges the battery on the road. So all the wheels ever see is electricity. That's all they know. It's an electric car. But when the battery gets low, um, you're actually running on gasoline to recharge the battery. Now, that sounds pretty kludgy and weird, but what's really clever about it is that 75% of days, people drive less than 40 miles, uh, which means that most Volt drivers on most days won't need to burn any gas at all. And when they do burn gas, because this will be a engine optimized just to run a generator, you know, it won't have lots of gears and stuff, um, they're talking about 50 miles per gallon when you are running gasoline. Sounds pretty phenomenal. Well, but is it true? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's tough to do this, or someone would have done it a long time ago. Um, the big problem with electric cars, Russ, has always been the battery. Originally, cars were electric. When the first cars came along, they were a third of them were steam powered, a third were electric, a third were internal combustion. Internal combustion triumphed because gasoline got very good. Gasoline's a very high energy. Energy dense, I guess, is the phrase. Substance. And you couldn't figure out a way to store electricity and carry it around with you in the car. And that was the killer problem until just a few years ago when lithium-ion batteries came along. But it's still a very big problem. Building a battery that can drive 40 miles for an affordable price is a big engineering challenge. And that is what GM is working on even as we speak. And by the way, not just GM. Toyota is hard at it. Nissan is talking about an all-battery car, though they haven't put a date on it and so forth. But GM has put a date on it. And what date, uh, what, was their, what was their original idea? How old is this project? When did it start? And when did they originally hope to finish it? And what is their current prognosis? They decided to try to get this car into dealer showrooms, that is, into the hands of consumers by late 2010. And that is one of the two or three things that is most startlingly ambitious about this effort. Another is the price point, which we'll get to. Trying to do this, though, in five years would not be all that hard. Trying to do it two years from now basically means developing this car and getting it to market in no more time than it takes to build the next model of any ordinary car that's out there on the road. It is a fantastically ambitious timescale. This all started in, um, it welled up in 2005. GM was was just hemorrhaging money. Um, It had a terrible reputation on the environment. It was coming off a fiasco called the EV1. Does that ring a bell for you? 
Only because I think it's the card that my uh, listeners and occasionally my readers of my blog write me about, and they say, well, American car makers could could create an electric car, but since that would hurt their gas-powered cars, they, they, they've destroyed all the ideas and, and all the creativity because they don't want to lose their gas uh, profits. And I suspected that when I'd get those emails that maybe that's not quite the whole story. <laughs> That's what you hear. I spent a lot of time inside GM talking to the people building the Volt, who it turns out are many of the same people who built the EV1. And the story is actually richer and a lot more interesting than that. Back in, I'll go back a little ways. I think this is an interesting tale. Back in 1988, GM's engineers entered an international electric car challenge. Now, 1988 is 20 years ago, so technology was far then from what it's become today. But they won this race with this car called the Sun Racer. They were really excited about that. There have always been a lot of believers in electric, electric propulsion in GM's lab. So they got enthusiastic. They decided to build an electric car. They thought it would be the car of the future. Uh, regulators in, in government came along, California, and said, well, if GM can do this, everyone should have to do this. In fact, we're going to mandate that everyone who wants to sell cars in California build an electric car. Well, that really set the automakers to gnashing their teeth because they can build an electric car, but there's no market for it. It's very hard to sell at that point. So anyway, GM goes hard at work on this, and they produce the EV1, which whatever you think of it commercially, everybody who's ever dealt with it inside GM, outside of GM, they say this car was a technological masterpiece in terms of its reduced rolling friction, its aerodynamics, the battery, the internal controls. It was an astonishing piece of work. So they market the EV1, but guess what? Its range is initially like 70 or 80 miles, never gets higher than 110. And it turns out people want a car that you can drive more than 80 miles because they're afraid they'll get stuck out there. And the thing takes, you know, 8 to 10 hours to charge. Here's the other problem with the EV1. GM loses their shirt every time they make one. Because the market for it's in the thousands, not the tens, to say nothing of hundreds of thousands. It's it's practically a handmade car. What were they pricing the car at? Do you remember? I don't remember. Um, was, but They weren't selling a lot of them. Well, in fact, they weren't selling them at all. They were leasing them. Um, they never put them out there, put a price on it, said drive it home and keep it, because it was still an experimental car. And so they were worried about liability, and they wanted to keep control of it as an experimental program. So I think they put like five or 6000 out there. But it was a very expensive program for them. And come this decade, they start losing a lot of money, and they're bleeding like a stuck pig. So they kill the program because it's costing them a lot of money. There's, there's no way they believe they can ever sell nearly enough of those cars so that they won't lose their shirt. And, of course, at that point, gasoline's pretty inexpensive. So gasoline, the appeal of that, it is... This is in the background. It's, it's really crucial. People are running around buying SUVs because gas is so cheap. So who's going to drive an electric car that, that makes, you know, that, that goes um, 80 to 110, 120 miles between charges? Um, so they kill the program, and it's a public re- relations fiasco. They manage in the great story tradition of GM to make the thing look as bad as it possibly could. Spokesman, I don't know whether out of ignorance or mendacity, but a spokesman actually goes out and says, we're not destroying the car only to have the car be destroyed. Um, some people in a helicopter get footage of the cars being destroyed. GM looks like liars. They look like they've destroyed the electric car because they hate electric cars. The true story is that inside GM, they're extremely proud of the EV1, and they feel it's a case of no good deed went unpunished. And the reason it got destroyed, they tell me off the record, is because the lawyers told them they had to do it. There was too much liability risk and having these cars out there on the street all the time if they didn't have an ongoing program to support them and and so forth. So at this Um, point, it's a little bit like – it reminds me of the Newton, a technological marvel, but just doesn't fit into the marketplace at the time. It it doesn't fit into the marketplace, and they feel it's like no good deed goes unpunished. Um, And they also will tell you today, GM's top brass has said they made a mistake by killing that car, because here's the other thing that happened. Gas is really cheap. GM is not doing so well. So they not only kill the EV1, they do something that's actually, in the big scheme of things, more important. They kill their hybrid program. Um, 
1998 or so, Toyota launches inside Japan without any fanfare at all. This little car that it's not a plug-in electric, but it's it's an internal combustion car that has a battery in it and a generator, and it recaptures energy when you brake the car. It actually uses that energy to run a generator and recharge a battery. So it uses that battery to extend the gas mileage by recycling its own energy. Um, it's, it's technologically quite sophisticated. So in the late 90s, they quietly put this thing on the road in Japan, and in about 2000, they quietly bring it to the United States. And Toyota, being a very cautious company that does not like to make mistakes, gradually ramps up this car. It goes into second generation and starts becoming commercially viable. goes into third generation, it becomes a hit. I'm sure you know what car I'm talking about. Yes, I've just been in California for six weeks, and there are Pri, or the Prius is everywhere. There are Priuses everywhere. It's, uh, I see them all over the streets in Washington now. It's the new VW bug. Um, Toyota lost money on the Prius for uh, quite a few years, and that's what people tell us. We don't know for sure, but, but you know, almost for certain. But Toyota has much deeper pockets than GM. Last time I looked, their market cap was like 20 times GM, so they could afford to do that. So GM is looking at the Prius. And they're having trouble financially, and they say, you know, we just don't see any way to make money on a car like that. Um, we, don't, we don't get why that would make any sense. They kill their hybrid program. This is in the early 2000s. This is a much bigger mistake than the EV1. The EV1s was a public relations mistake, but killing the hybrid program was a strategic mistake because they walk away from that market just as it takes off. Toyota becomes master of the, of the hybrid market. The Prius gives it this enormous image boost as the politically correct car, the green car. Toyota just gets immense mileage, and everyone at GM is gnashing their teeth, thinking, that could have been us. Because GM's technology was at pace with Toyota's. They could have done the same thing in the same time frame, but they didn't. So GM gets caught without any kind of hybrid program at all, and it's now 2005, 2006. Toyota is eating their lunch. In 2005, GM is, people are talking about bankruptcy because it's losing money so fast in 2005. It does a lot of things to try to straighten that out. But people in the company are, they're kind of desperate. Um, they understand that, that GM is, is getting beaten up every day in terms of pub, public relations, in terms of product quality. They do these focus groups and discover that people like the GM cars better if you take the name tag off. Once you tell them GM, they don't like it anymore. That's how bad the brand has become. It's kind of like the Republican Party brand here in Washington. Um, so folks inside GM decide they need to make a big play. They've got to do something bold because otherwise they feel they'll just get they're just getting left behind. They can feel they're losing their they're losing their margin every day to the Japanese. And in 07 they become the second largest car maker in the world. In 08, yeah. Or was it 08? It's going to Give, happen this year. Giving and, up um, the title to Toyota. In terms of production they may have lost the title already. In terms of sales they probably they'll lose it any minute now. So that's what they're looking at. So really, you get a company that's got a combination of they made a terrible mistake on, um, on hybrids, and they're financially desperate, and they need a big play. And in the great tradition of Americans, who, you know, as Winston Churchill said, Americans always do the right thing once they've exhausted every other option. GM decides to do something really spectacularly different and take a Hail Mary pass, and that's where the Volt comes from early 2006, they put a team together. Bob Lutz tells him, guys, I want, I want, a, an, I want a car. It's got to be electric. Is Bob Lutz. I better tell you, should I tell you about Bob Lutz? Sure, go ahead. Electric cars? Yeah. Bob Lutz is a famous marketing executive who has worked at all of the big three, GM, Ford, and Chrysler, um, spent many years working in Europe. Um, is renowned for his kind of sense of of what the market will think is a really cool car. He retired from the auto business a few years ago. And uh, as his retirement job, he became chairman of this company called Exide. Would you care to get, take a guess what Exide made? 
Sounds like batteries. Yeah, you must have read my article. I even remembered a little of it. Yeah. Exide made car batteries. So for three years, Lutz is working at a company that makes batteries for propulsion. And we ride around, people ride around in electric cars all the time. They're called golf carts. Or all, all these little quiet vehicles, like if you go to the Jefferson Memorial in Washington, the park rangers are zipping around in these, these cart-like contraptions. They're electric. Electric is great for cars. It is much better for propulsion than internal combustion. Because when you turn on an electric motor, it's completely on all the way. It doesn't have to go through gears to get up, up to full torque. It's either on or it's off. Full torque immediately. It's great. It's smooth. It's clean. It's quiet. Um, the problem is the battery. So here's Bob Lutz looking at all the batteries and all the cars in the world, thinking electric propulsion is really, it's really cool. This is also a guy, he, though he thinks global warming is a myth, he's terribly concerned about dependence on oil, um, both for national security reasons and because a lot of people in the car industry, this is a sea change since the 90s, have come to see dependence on gasoline as the growth bottleneck in the industry's future. They think that the real constraint on the ability to grow the car market will be dependence on a fuel that causes global warming, that puts money in the pockets of dictators, that has enormous price volatility, and so forth. So they want to get off gasoline because they now see it as a limit to their future prospects. So Lutz goes back to GM after Exide. He's recruited back. He becomes... He's put in charge of, of repairing their, at that point, droopy and boring product line. And he decides he wants an electric car. He keeps saying in the company, let's do an electric car. The company keeps saying, forget it. Been there, done that. It was a fiasco last time. Can't do it. Unaffordable. No one will buy it. Too expensive. Or we're invested in fuel cells. GM has this big fuel cell program. That's, that was their big bet for the car of the future. And what is that? A fuel cell Briefly. takes hydrogen and uses a catalyst to convert it to, guess what, electric power, which runs the car. People think about the fuel cell as a hydrogen-powered car, and it is in the sense that you put hydrogen in it, but it's really an electric-powered car if that's what you're using the hydrogen to make. It's a point worth coming back to, actually, because there's, there's a revelation in GM when people realize, wait a minute, a fuel cell car is just an electric car. So what we've been talking about at GM all along is the electric car. We just haven't been telling people that's what we're talking about. So that melts some of the resistance internally. Then what happens is in 2005, this small startup Silicon Valley company called Tesla announces it's going to production with an all-electric Roadster. Uh, Roadster, you know, is a two-person compact car. Slightly pricey. Very pricey, $100,000. Rich person's toy, but a technological marvel, going to be super fast. It's going to be um, lithium-ion battery. That's the other thing that changes. You get lithium-ion batteries. So now you can contemplate an electric car because the old batteries were just too big and too heavy. Lithium-ion, it's at least possible. Let's seize Tesla, and he says, he basically, as he told me in an interview, he basically just started pounding the table. He told me he lost it in a meeting at GM, and he said, if this little company in Silicon Valley can produce and market an electric car, it is no longer acceptable for me to hear that GM cannot do it. He calls a meeting um, December of of 2005, um, calls in his guys and says, I want an electric car. They go to work on this, come back to him and other people and say, you know, we can't do an electric car that's marketable, that's all battery. But they cast their mind back to this, this little funny car that GM produced years ago, back when they were doing testing the EV1 on the test track. The EV1 had a range at that point like 60 or 70 miles, so you're trying to test the car. You've got it on the test track. You drive it 60 miles, and then you have to recharge it for eight hours. You know, at that rate, you're never going to get the thing tested. So some engineers, being ingenious people, go out and they get themselves a Kawasaki motorcycle engine. They put it in a little trailer. They hook it up to a generator. 
they hooked the generator up to the battery in the EV1, and they put the EV1 out there on the test track with this little internal combustion motorcycle engine powered recharger. So now they can drive it around the test track all day. It'll recharge itself. So some of the engineers think, hey, that's a pretty good idea. Let's let's try that in a car, you know, a real car. Doesn't love, get anywhere. I love that. <laughs> it's uh, and and you'll like this. The reason it doesn't get anywhere is in that in those days, the nineties, the regulatory mandate was for a zero emission car. That's what John McCain's talking about again, a zero emission car. Well, there is no such thing because even an all electric car, you've got the emissions from the power plant that makes the electricity. Yeah, it's just hidden <clears throat> a little bit. Yeah, you just move where the emissions come from. So yeah. there's nothing special about having nothing come out of the tailpipe, but what that mandate did do is distort the market so that instead of considering what became the Volt years earlier, it got put on the shelf because everyone said, well, it's not zero emission because it's still got this internal combustion generator on board. And that's just to add the, to the range of it and when it eventually Exactly, right. Out. So they shelved that idea, but along, you know, 2006, um, very little technology ultimately goes to waste. They remember this experiment, and this gives them the idea for the onboard recharger for this new hybrid. So they go hard to work. They they, um, hold a long series of meetings and discussions. Something interesting happens here. When they first float the idea of this new car, they call it the iCar, they want it to be like the iPod. The thinking there is that there's no new technology in an iPod. It's a new package, though. It changes the way people think about the product, and Apple Computer Company repositions themselves as a, as a consumer, um, as a music and consumer electronics company, changes the way they think about music because it's so beautifully packaged. It hits a sweet spot. And it turns around Apple. So GM's going, well, we need an iCar. It's going to be to GM as the iPod was to Apple. Initially, they think it's going to be a car with like maybe a plug-in with maybe a 10-mile range. As they go through these meetings, GM decides that's not enough. Our situation is so bad, we've got to do something really, really difficult. We've got to do a car that will go so far on the battery that a lot of drivers won't even perceive it as a gasoline-powered car because most of the time they'll be plugging it in. That's when they decide to go for the 40-mile range that the Volt's going to have. Now, that is really difficult because it requires a very large, very sophisticated battery with 300 cells in it, any one of which goes out, the whole battery stops working, potentially, and very complicated software and control equipment just to keep the thing from overheating, for example, and burning up, just for example. Um, People I talk to outside GM criticize this decision. They say, you know, a 20-mile battery would have been much easier to do, much less risky. But GM decided they wanted a car that would, in the public's mind, finally, for the first time, break the umbilical cord between the gas tank and the automobile. They wanted to change the whole perception of the game that was being played, and they wanted to be first. Um, Detroit Auto Show, January of 2007, after briefing some reporters in secret ahead of time, they announced the Chevy Volt. Um, They put a concept car out there. They're expecting it to pop, but they don't expect what actually happens. By pop? By pop, you mean succeed? Succeed as a public relations venture. They expect to get some media for it. Now, here's what you need to bear in mind. These car shows are full of concept cars. Every major car maker brings its latest car of the future, its latest nifty gadget, its latest ideas. You know, GM GM has done dozens of these things over the years, but few, if any, of these concept cars ever get to the showroom. You know, they're considered like gee whiz stuff, science projects, to get reporters interested. Um. So the Volt might very well have looked like that. So they put the Volt out there, and the reaction is astonishing. Um, GM that year won both North American Car and Truck of the Year, two for two, at that show, which is a very big deal in the auto world, but that news was completely eclipsed by the Volt. Um, This leaves them, as you can imagine, walking on air at GM. It gets the board of directors very excited, excited, 
But it also puts them in a box because now that they've got the world so excited, they've actually got to build the car. And that, and they've got to do it by 2010, which at that point is, what, uh, three and a half years away, the end of 2010. So they've now bitten off a big mouthful. And that's where they are now. They've got to build this car. They've, they've got that project well underway. And they say they're still on time. Um, we'll see. Tell me about your writing of that story, where you got on board, how much of it you watched in real time. And one of the things that's fascinating about the story is, and you you actually write about it, is the transparency or apparent transparency. It's hard to really know sort of two layers. As, as the reader, I don't know quite how transparent GM was with you. And of course, you're not quite sure either. But I'd be curious what your perception was of how honest they were with you. On the surface, in the article, they were very, very honest. So I'd be curious, tell me about how the story came to be and how much time and and the kind of things you were able to, to have access to. Well, it, it came to be after a series of discussions over time. I wanted to write about GM because it's such an iconic American company. And when 2005, when I got interested, it was in such deep trouble my initial thought was to, to try to write an inside account of how this mighty corporation tries to get out of the fix it's in, and for various reasons, that didn't work out. But it did establish some, some contact with GM. What was especially interesting about the Volt to write about is, in some ways, the technological challenge is the least of what they're doing in terms of how interesting and different it is. In order to make this car, GM has basically had to shred the rule book for car making. They're breaking all the rules. Not the first time they've done this. They did this with the Saturn, for example. I was going to ask you about that. We can come back and talk about the Saturn. We should. Um, And some other things. GM, actually, it's deep in their DNA. From the beginning, they have been a company that that has liked to take big gambles. Uh, Only rarely, however, have they pulled one off. But this car was partly interesting, not just for the car itself, but for the way, for what it was, what it was doing for the company. They were using it as a way to increase their risk-taking metabolism. They took this risk on purpose. They knew that it was going to be hard. They knew that the world would say what, in fact, a lot of industry observers, third-party analysts say, which is, what the heck are they thinking? The risks here are enormous. What if they put this car out there and it burns up? What if it doesn't work? What do you do about the warranty? What do you do about the dealerships? You're going to have to train, by the end of 2010, hundreds of dealers across the country to service an electric car, something they've never seen the likes of before. You're going to have to prepare the utilities to deal with the charging. You're going to have to figure out what the heck you put on the miles per gallon label when... For most drivers, most of the time, it's not burning any gas at all. The, um, you get questions like, do you want one charge port or two? What do you do about people who don't have a, have a, a garage to park in? Um, the questions go on and on. Well, in the car business, the way you usually approach something new and different is y- you do it in a skunk works. Um, you keep it as quiet as you can until you're sure it's going to work, and then you unveil it and everybody goes ooh and ah. Um, And that would mean for a car like this, that first you build the battery, which is the hardest thing to build. You make sure that you've got a battery that's small enough and light enough and reliable enough, which is really hard, and durable enough, which is even harder, because you've got to have a battery that will last 10 years driving around on bumpy roads. And this battery doesn't look like a Duracell. This thing is full of computers, software, uh, it looks like something out of Star Trek. Hardest of all, you've got to manufacture the battery. The quality here has to be immense because if even one of the cells doesn't work, you compromise the whole thing. So normally you'd solve all those problems first, and then once you've got the battery in hand, you would build the rest of the car around it. Instead of doing that, GM decided they're going to go for real-time invention. They're going to build the car and the battery at the same time which means if they have problems with the battery, the whole car stops in its tracks and they miss their deadline. So that's rule number one that they break. Rule number two that they break 
is they decide to go public with it early on. They're going to throw the doors open. They feel one reason that they got burned with the EV1 is that the public didn't know how hard they were really trying to make it succeed, how hard they really worked on it. So they said, okay, this time we are going to show the world what we're doing. And that way, if it fails, at least people will say, people will understand that we really gave it everything we had. It'll at least change the way people think about about GM, about global warming, and so on. So they've opened the doors to this program in a way that's, that's almost unprecedented in the car industry. In, in the battery lab, which normally is a top-secret location where you can't even bring a cell phone, much less a camera, they've got TV crews trooping through there. And gangs of reporters, they're showing them the design studio. Um, to my own astonishment, um, I had been, you know, I hadn't even asked if I could actually see the car as it's being designed. The version you'll see in production doesn't look all that much like the one, like the show car. The show car was, looked like a sports car. It was really hot and snazzy and, in my opinion, pretty inappropriate for um, an everyday driving car. Um, but I walked into the design center and they pulled the sheet right off the, right off the uh, production design. Um, I couldn't take a picture of it and I couldn't describe it in detail. But without even uh, without my even having to uh, to press them, am I allowed to ask they you? They pulled the sheet off. Am I allowed to ask you if the uh, the snippets that have been shown in the Olympic ads and elsewhere uh, for GM are the same? Have you seen those? I've yeah, I've seen some of what they've shown. They've like revealed the front corner and yeah. the back corner, and I think the grill, and that sort of thing. And they're saying they'll reveal the whole thing now, probably in November at the LA Auto Show. It's a beautiful car. The parts I've seen. Um, yeah, I don't know it's what it looks snazzy, like right but... now, um, but it's it's um, it struck me as a good looking car. Um, it's got to be extremely aerodynamic because when you're working with electricity and you're trying to squeeze that fortieth mile out of the battery. Something as small as a side view mirror that's not aerodynamic will really make a difference. But anyway, the bottom line, Russ, is they're doing this car in the full glare of publicity. Um, and that means if they fail, and a lot of people think they will fail just because this is so difficult, they're going to fail in full, in full public view. And people will say, once again, GM makes a promise and doesn't deliver. And GM has a history of doing that. So it's a very big risk for them. But in addition to them pulling the sheet off, um, they also gave you exposure and t- FaceTime with some of the chief engineers. And um, I was fascinated that they spent that much time with you and were as honest as they were about the challenges. They are, in some ways, it's in their interest to explain how great the challenges are because they want people to see this as a major effort at a breakthrough. They want people to know it's it's tough. Um, but it this is, is tough. what kind of <laughs> what kind of turned my head around. I would go to them. I talked to outsiders, and they would list the reasons this is not going to work. And there are a lot of reasons we can go through the reasons it might not work. The battery, in some ways, is the least of them. The timeline is extremely ambitious, and they've put so much emphasis now on late 2010 that if it slips, everyone's going to know, and they'll be ridiculed. The price point is very ambitious. You can do this car if you're going to sell it for sixty or sixty thousand dollars or fifty thousand or whatever. Um, but they're talking about initially they were going to sell it around thirty. Now it's looking like it might be more like forty, which is a lot more expensive. But it still means they can't make money off the car at that price. They're going to lose money on every one of these that they sell, which is one of their best things right now, unfortunately, <laughs> for them. They're really good at losing money, so well, they can um, barely afford that. This is a big commercial gamble, right? It's um, The car, as much of a technological gamble as it is, you can solve a technology problem with a bunch of smart engineers in a room if it's solvable. But the financial gamble here is that if the car is a hit, commercially it's a strain financially. And that's not the ideal place for a car company to be with a new product, a popular loss leader. That's the EV1 again, but... but but even more but popular. But of course, the EV1 is... was a niche car, and, and GM can lose some money on, you know, 3,000 leased cars. 
What they're talking about for the Volt, though, is selling them in the tens of thousands. They say again and again, this is, this is not a toy for rich people. This is going to be a car for one-car families, and we're going to sell these in the hundreds of thousands. Um, they branded it Chevy, Chevrolet. Chevrolet is their brand for the masses. Um, that's, you know, it's not Cadillac. It's not even Saturn. They're sending the message there that they, this is a car that they're going to sell worldwide. Chevy is their most global brand. It'll be an international car right from the start. Um, Do you have any... So th- if they sell a lot of these things, they lose a lot of money. And what they're betting on is that the, the cost curve on production and the battery will come down fast enough yeah. so that it'll justify itself. And they're also betting that gasoline prices will stay high. If gasoline prices collapse, they won't be able to sell the thing. Do you have any feel for the size of the the resource devotion here, the commitment? How many engineers or, or what? Do they give an estimate of how much money they've put into the project? Did you have a feel for that? And is it? do you feel that it's growing? Because I would think as that deadline approaches, they're going to be awfully tempted to devote more to it. It is growing. Um, I couldn't get, and I'm not sure they have precise numbers for how much this program costs because it ropes in resources from all around GM, including research that's gone on from before the Volt even existed. But the numbers that they were talking about and they told me they're talking about are in the order of half a billion to a billion dollars. Now, building a brand new model car, conventional car, internal combustion car, is a 250 to $500 million enterprise, sometimes more than that depending on the car. It can, it can even be a billion. Um, I walked into this article thinking, well, what's so hard about building a car? I walked out of it thinking, it's a miracle of capitalism that a single automobile ever gets built. The sheer number of moving parts that have to work together and have to arrive at the end of the assembly line at the same moment is mind-boggling. Um, just keeping track of them all so that you don't get to the end of the process and discover that you forgot to, to deal with the fit of the taillight, very difficult. So engineers are, the staff is in the hundreds, um, and that's escalating as they get closer to production. What's happening now is that they're, they're moving, they've moved from the conception stage where they're designing the car on paper and all being, and they were all excited about, hey, we can do this to the execution phase, which is they've actually got to build something that they can drive around on a track, and that's what they're doing now. They're testing the car's systems in in what they call um, engineering development vehicles, where you take the shell of an existing car, a Chevy Malibu as it happens, and you put the systems for this new car in it and see how what happens if you drive them around. So one of these cars might have the battery and another might have the the underbody and so on. And then as they go through this process and get closer to production, they'll do prototypes. They'll have to start tooling factories. They're going to build it in a plant near Detroit, Hamtramck, Detroit, which ironically is the plant in Michael Moore's movie, Roger and Me, where he he hammers GM for its record in Hamtramck and in Detroit closing plants. Well, that's where the Volt's going to be built. Um, Then when you start building plants, you get into the thousands, uh, you know, when you tool up for this thing. It becomes an engi- a giant industrial project, which the EV1, for example, never was. Well, let, let's talk about the Saturn. Uh, the Saturn was released with – the Saturn was, was created. The whole enterprise is created with a similar amount of hoopla, not quite as much, but a similar amount of hoopla. And, and I think – I don't know. You'll know better than I do. I felt at the time it was an attempt to – change the corporate culture at GM through innovation. The same similar story that you're telling here, and it it failed. Uh, it didn't fail as a car. It's still out there, and you can still buy them. But it did not affect GM, I think, the way that it was supposed to or was intended to. Yeah, that's, that's right, Russ. Looking at GM, looking at the Saturn, uh, were one of the reasons I walked into this article thinking, this is a story about the technological hurdle of solving this battery problem. And I left the story thinking, no, this is really a story about the organizational hurdle 
of changing a corporate culture and the commercial hurdle of breaking through with a radical new product in a market that may not be ready when you're financially weak. It's really much more a business risk than a technology risk. And one of the reasons I thought that was looking at GM's record. Um, They do have a pattern of getting behind, getting in trouble, and trying these Hail Mary technology passes. Roger Smith, for instance, decided to have a massive plant modernization program and spent something like $50, $40 billion is the number that's that's thrown around um, on robots and high-tech manufacturing, and that money went right down the drain. They got virtually nothing for their, their investment. Meanwhile, Toyota was slogging ahead with incremental improvements. You know, their famous method of improving everything all the time incrementally. No, no big gambles on new technology. Just make everything better. And guess who won that argument? And then there was the Saturn. Um, in the 70s, when gas prices spiked, as they're doing today, people suddenly wanted small cars, as they're doing today. And GM discovered it could not build a decent small car to save its life. Um, it tried, actually, and it, it failed. Its small cars were, were just terrible. So it did two things. It went into a joint venture with Toyota called Numi, which I think still exists. Um, and they launched the Saturn project. They named it after the space program. It was going to be a moonshot dimensions kind of effort. They were going to create an entire new part of the company separate from the main corporate culture. They were going to design a whole new car in record time, three years, which is half what it normally took GM to build a car in those years. And then they were going to take what they learned from Saturn. Oh, by the way, a whole new dealer network and a whole new way of selling the cars to customers. No more haggling. Yep. Um, And they were going to take what they learned from that venture and spread it around the whole company and reinvent GM. There was a huge amount of hoopla over the Saturn. Um, possibly the equivalent of the hoopla over the Volt. It got great press. Uh, as with the Volt, they played it up at, at every turn. Um, and when the cars came out, they succeeded. People loved them. There were waiting lists to buy them by 1992 and 93. They loved the New Dealer Network. The whole thing was a smash hit. And they, then they had GM, very good ads. <laughs> yeah, very good ads and good cars, actually. Um, and then GM simply dropped the ball. GM's Downfall, time and again, also, for instance, with the, the joint venture with Toyota, has been follow-through. It's, it's not striving for the breakthrough. It's capitalizing it, building on it, sticking with it, spending the money and effort that's required to turn a short-term success into a long-term success. Saturn, well, the unions pushed back because they didn't like the organizational privileges that, that Saturn was given. Um, Management pushback. They didn't like that either, and it was a new way of doing things. Um, the cars were successful in terms of the numbers it sold, but they struggled to break even. Uh, they weren't making money on Saturn in the short term. This might be starting to sound familiar to you. Um, so they just decided to let the program languish. They basically folded it back into the bureaucratic structure, turned Saturn into just a little, just another nameplate. They let the cars get boring and mediocre. They starved them of new product. Um, and they basically just let the whole thing die on its feet. Um, only now is Saturn getting its act back together. Um, and what Saturn became was an object lesson that, that it's not just making the initial opportunity, it's building on it that's really difficult. And the same will be true, I'm convinced, of the Volt. You can make this car as a technological feat, but then you've got to stick with it past those initial years when it loses money. You may have to lose your shirt on it for a while, and if you're GM, that's very hard to do. You're going to have to create a whole market for it. It took Toyota almost a decade to build the Prius into the success that it became. So they're going to have to show a kind of patience and stamina, which for a Breakthrough-oriented company requires a change in the corporate culture, and they know it, and that's part of the point. That's part of why they're doing this, and that's part of why they're doing it so openly. They are forcing themselves to change by making the price of failure too high. Oh, it fascinates me 
among many. I mean, it's, a, it's such an interesting story. I love the nexus of corporate culture and innovation. But just on the innovation side, there's there are two two things that are totally out of GM's control, mostly out of their control. One is the price of gasoline, and the other is the world's perception, the public's perception of global warming. It's a very cold year this year, uh, and it may continue. There are a lot of climate people saying it's we're in for a little mini spell of cold weather. That's going to dampen the public's enthusiasm for cars that uh, that fight global warming, whether it's true or not, that they do. Uh, we had an earlier podcast where Mike Munger at Duke University quoted the professor of the chemistry department there who admitted that the Prius didn't really have any impact on global warming, but it, he owned one anyway because it was the right thing to do. And certainly perception plays a huge role in the popularity of the Prius, not just any science that might be in its favor. So here you have this car being rolled out at a time when it seems to be getting a little bit cooler outside. And unfortunately for GM and good for the rest of us, uh, the price of gasoline has been trending downward steadily now for the last few months, uh, last month or so, and, and may continue, may not, but you don't know. And how much of this gamble depends on those events that are outside their control. It's incredible, really. Well, that's exactly right. It's one of the many reasons why if you were doing an ordinary corporate balance sheet calculation on this car, you probably wouldn't do it. And in fact, they did not do those calculations on this car. This car is born to some extent of GM's, GM's dire need for a change of image and a change of culture. Most cars, as Bob Lutz told me, you design the entire car on paper and then you cost it out. You put it in front of the accountants and you make sure there's a business plan for the car. This car, they never even did that. They said, GM has got to have a breakthrough product. We're going to build the car first and then wait for the business plan. Um, we're, that's the kind of, that's the magnitude of risk they're taking for this car. But one of the things they will tell you, actually, is that, and here's, here's an ironic surprise. You know those cafe standards, those mileage per gallon standards right. that the U.S. government has and which, in a, in a bill that President Bush signed last December, those standards were raised from 25 miles per gallon corporate fleet average to 35 miles per gallon corporate fleet average. Effective when? Um, you know, I think 20, is it 2015, 2020? We'll I'm look not it up, sure. But it's, it's in the future. It's years in the future. The, yeah, I the, think it's, I think it's, um, it's 2020, if the, I recall correctly. The, but check me on that. Well, so the, just for so, people who aren't familiar with it, the idea is that the the corporate fleet is the corporate fleet of the manufacturer that their average fuel efficiency has to reach that goal, weighted by, I think, sales, right? I think that's right, yeah. Well, Which distorts their pricing of the cars, of course, the weight of the cars. It's, I think it's a horrible rule, but never mind. Keep going. <laughs> well, what the people at GM will tell you is that neither they nor any car maker in the world knows how to meet that standard with existing technology. In order to do it, you're going to need a different kind of car. And they believe that these cafe limits have handed the Volt a business case because depending how regulators decide to look at the Volt, of course, because sometimes it runs on gas and sometimes it doesn't run on gas, depending how they look at it, though, if it's very fuel efficient, that gives them room within their miles per gallon standard to sell more cars of the conventional sort. It buys them breathing space to make this transition. Um, so one of the things that GM thinks is that although they're taking some risks here, they've also got brought themselves a hedge against the regulatory increase. They also believe that long-term gas prices, that the, the era of cheap gas is over. We'll see if that's true. Yeah, I'd be curious be right. to know what you think. Oh, they might be right. I don't know. Nobody really knows. I think, yeah. the, I think the peak oil um, obsession, is, as we've talked about here before, is uh, oversold. I don't think it's necessarily true that gas prices will continue to rise steadily, and the last month seems to suggest that that, that may not be the case. Yeah, um, yeah. But when... And, and and we don't know. And history, as you, as I'm sure you'll attest, has again and again proven these yeah. assumptions about the future to be just dismally totally wrong. wrong. This what? could be a car that is, you know, comes to market in 2010 and 
you know, no one needs it, no one wants it. Yesterday's newspaper, we're not worried about about that anymore. Or it could be the opposite. Uh, one thing your your story about the cafe standards illustrates, though, is that in addition to ramping up their engineering department, I suspect GM will also be ramping up its lobbying department to make sure that um, the EPA interprets those uh, mileage estimates in their favor. Because it's, well, it's inherently ambiguous, as you point out. Yeah, it's a new kind of car, and it's going to be interesting to see how the government deals with it. Um, and and that is, that's one of the challenges they face. Another is the electricity infrastructure. That's not a short-term problem because you can charge up these cars at night when the electric grid has extra capacity. In fact, one of the nifty things about plug-in electric cars generally is the battery in the car becomes storage for electricity that otherwise would go to waste. So um, during the night, you download electricity into your car battery, and then you drive around on it during the day. And you can, with existing capacity, uh, spare capacity will, will... let you put a number of hundreds of thousands of plug-ins on the road. But after that, you're going to have to build an electrical plant. So they're, so they're talking to the utilities about that as well. That's, that's another open-ended question. Because right, what you've really got is a coal-powered car at that point. If, if, you, get, if you sell enough of them, uh, the global warming story doesn't work as well. Well, it still works. Even it turns out, it, it depends how you calculate. Um, but even on coal power, the better calculations I've seen suggest that a plug-in electric does slightly better than a gasoline-powered car. And, of course, if you're getting your electricity nuclear. from hydro or yeah. methane or nuclear, which or could, nuclear yeah. um, then the effects on global warming are, are far better. Let me ask you another regulatory question. Maybe you know the answer. I don't. It's easy to make an electric car that gets great mileage. Uh, an all-electric car, as you point out, we've we've got one. It's called a golf cart. But a golf cart, besides the, I assume there's a range issue, but there's also a safety issue. So I assume one of the other constraints that faces a car a car company trying to develop an electric car is that if you have a heavy battery and you want to substitute lighter materials for the body of the car, you're up against that um, safety standard issue. Is that correct? Do you know anything about that? I I don't know much about that. I know that. One of the big issues in designing any car is meeting the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration safety tests, and a whole lot of testing goes on around that. And my understanding is that one of the reasons that the Tesla electric car has been somewhat late is um, is meeting these these safety standards. They also uh, had a transmission problem; they didn't really work right. Yeah, uh, I think some... the transmission was was the bigger issue that that they faced. But the Tesla is now out. Um, their showroom is open in, I think, Santa Monica and in Palo and in Menlo Park. Um, they also are developing uh, a family sedan car to go along with the Roadster, which would be a, a, a potential competitive threat to the the Volt, uh, along with the other comp- conventional companies, as you pointed out, that are working on it. The other one, a competitor, I want to mention. There's a totally different approach being taken called Better Place which is trying to create a car that would be charged by a set of uh, standalone charging stations where you'd either plug it in at those and charge quickly or would just replace the, swap the batteries out. And that's being uh, tried, I think, uh, in, is, is in hopes of being used in Israel and in Norway. And we'll put up a link to their uh, efforts as well and a story about them. So there's a whole bunch of innovation going on, some of it uh, perhaps promising, and um, it's just exciting to see all the creativity. Yeah, and I ought to mention that a big part of the business risk for the Volt, for GM, is they're not working in a vacuum. Toyota has announced that they are going to have a plug-in electric car uh, in experimental fleets, meaning hundreds of cars, not tens of thousands. So it's much less ambitious than what GM is talking about, but uh, they're now saying they're going to do that before the end of 2010. And Toyota's the inverse of GM because they always under-promise and over-deliver. Um, and it's, Toyota's a formidable company. So they're in the race. Um, Nissan is in the race. Uh, lots of companies now are starting to get on board electricity, partly as a result of what GM is doing.
Um, so it's, it's going to be a horse race. Well, in two years, we'll talk again, if not sooner, and find out how it turned out. Uh, one thing worth mentioning, and I, I think I have the numbers right, maybe you know better than I do, um, as you mentioned in the beginning of the podcast, GM is an iconic American company. It goes back to the early, if not of the twenty earliest part of the twentieth century, if not the end of the nineteenth. It is the company that was always used as the embodiment of big business and and corporate America. But in nineteen seventy nine, uh, GM was at its peak of employment. I think it had six hundred thousand U.S. workers. Today, I think that number is around a hundred thousand, and I know that its unionized workforce is closer to 75. So its importance to the American economy is, is much smaller than it used to be in, in measured by employment. And the competition and this horse race that we're all that you and I are talking about between Tesla, between Better Place, between Toyota, Nissan, and GM, uh, we really don't have a big stake in how it turns out unless you're a GM stockholder or you're Bob Lutz. We're all going to benefit from that competition, and um, the world's going to be a better and more interesting place, I suspect, down the road. Yeah, I, th- I think that's right. Um, though I will say one of the fascinating things about this article is part of the reason this is happening is that GM, for all its size, now thinks of itself as something of an underdog yeah. in the car market. The world I grew up in, that was inconceivable. GM, you know, Naderites told us endlessly that GM essentially ran the entire country, if not the entire economy. Now they are doing this because they see themselves as a, as a company that is falling behind in public perception and to some extent in reality, and, and, and they're playing catch-up. They are trying to reproduce a startup mentality in, in, right in the center of this enormous, now 100-year-old bureaucracy. And it's just fascinating to watch a, a major American company try to pull that off. Well, thanks for um, giving us a little insight into it. It's, uh, it is a great story. My guest today has been Jonathan Rausch, guest scholar at the Brookings Institution. Jonathan, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.